All right, we are going to get started. Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Before we begin, um, I would like to acknowledge that as a land grant institution, the Department of Architecture and Urban Design at UCLA recognizes our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and uncivic territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. Um, it is really a pleasure to introduce Oana Stanescu this afternoon. Oana is a Romanian architect, designer, and curator, and an educator with current projects in Europe and uh, North America. She's the curator of the uh, 2024 Pera Biennial in Timisoara. I hope I didn't destroy that name. Uh, and has joined AUD this quarter as the SLE chair uh, to teach an advanced topic studio in the EMR program. Oana is the founding principal at the Oana Stanescu Design uh, Studio. Her work has been published extensively, including articles, project features, and interviews in the New York Times, the LA Times, Peanut, Architect Magazine, Vogue, W Magazine, Fast Company, The Economist, and a wide uh, ranging uh, list of online platforms that operate between architecture, art, and contemporary culture. Um, her former office, Family, was named Next Progressives by Architect Magazine in 2015. She was finalist in the MoMA PS1 competition in 2018 in a collaboration with textile designer Akane Moriyama. She taught a series of studios at MIT under the umbrella title of Blueprints of Justice in conversation with Virgil Abloh, Sherry Sperry, and Nora al -Haider. Um, and designed a miniature mountain for Kanye West's 2013 world tour. This project list is far from comprehensive. It is an understatement to say that Oana is prolific, uh, but the list does shed light on the kinds and range, uh, ranges of projects that Oana spends time with. You may ask whether these projects come to Oana or Oana goes looking after them. I don't know the answer, but I will definitely ask after the talk. I would speculate that her design philosophy, the range of her interests, and an intellectual practice that is at its core relational have much to do with Oana's capacity to use architecture and architectural thinking in a broad collection of sites. Here by sites, I don't mean only places, but also people's ideas, scales, and timelines shaping a multidisciplinary approach to design that connects architecture with art, technology, and social and political activism. While Luana has spent the last few years in Berlin, over the past two decades, she has been an itinerant figure operating between New York, Cambridge, London, Switzerland, Tokyo, South Africa, and Romania. This model is different from that of an architecture or an architect that has a home base with projects everywhere. In the case of Oana, she is everywhere. I came across a description of her life as one lived across cultures and the impact that this has on her creative process and thinking. This too has undoubtedly influenced and shaped her worldviews and her projects as well. I came to think that all of the work associated with Oana, whether her own or the work she does with students, um, has one embedded, is an, has one embedded with the aspirations and energy of revolutions. This is a word that Oana um, uses or has been used to interview her often. Sometimes this is expressed through scale, don't make it big, make it bigger or the smallest. Sometimes it is expressed through provocation by making the site of the architectural exploration one that is sensitive to current political and social plights. Sometimes it is reflected by the makeup of a collaboration, who sits at the table in the end and what that matters when producing new design or new knowledge. And while invoking the word revolution, I also invoke the, the hardship side of it, I am referring to the aspirations and ideas that lead to radical change. The revolution doesn't always uh, scream, but it is there. It can be hard, but can also be playful, whimsical, beautiful, and of course, imaginative and provocative. Um, I find the work and ideas in Oana's work humanist at its core, concerned with the most essential aspects of human life, our bodies and our bodily sensations, our relationships, our place in society, our sense of curiosity, in return, the projects give us a reflection of ourselves, slightly or radically transformed by architecture through the way in which we understand the world around us and our place in it. I want to finish the introduction with something Oana said when interviewed by Semi Permanent. It is simple, yet again powerful. She said to stay restless. Please join me in welcoming Oana Stanescu. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, I will ask you all to bear a little bit with me tonight, uh, trying out some things <laughs> and roping you 
all uh, in it with me. I will play a video that's really just, uh, I will be reading something to you that um, is related to this notion of cover me softly and this notion of covers that I've talked to many of you already about. And really, I thought the best way to talk about covers and musical covers and the relevancy of the topic, the interest for the, the topic for me, but also the relevancy of it today, would be by presenting you with a cover and then discussing its merits together with you. Uh, in, in reading you this cover, um, I will play, be playing a video in the background that you're welcome to look at, but the two have zero correlation, so you can just enjoy. Tuesday, nothing existed. Wednesday, November 2nd. How do you spend your time, she said. Reading, mostly, I said. I couldn't tell her that mostly, I said, staring at blank walls or getting stung into my heart. And then, one day, when I finally could find a master it again, making love to myself for hours at a time. The flame was dim and flickering, but it was a welcome relief to the long coldness. Orgasms are kind of like art level, but you know it when you see it. It may not be what you expect, but it will be different from everything else. Much of the scientific study of sexuality has been characterized by a deep anxiety about the subjective experiences of sexual pleasure and desire, especially when it's a matter of female pleasure. Those who dare refuse the gender norms and social conventions of sexual propriety, monogamy, heterosexuality, and marriage, or fail to abide by the script of female respectability were targeted as potential prostitutes, vagrants, deviants, and incorrigible children. <coughs> Immorality and disorder and promiscuity and inversion and pathology were the terms imposed to target and eradicate these practices of intimacy and affiliation. It was one's status that determined whether an intimate act, an evening spent with a stranger, or a pro proclivity to run the streets was a punishable offense. But there isn't any reason that a woman or women could take any or every role for any and every male. Though it does unmitigated violence to the West's traditional concept of women. But I believe it is only by inflicting such violences on the concept that we can prevent actual violence against women's bodies and minds in the political and material world. Feminists were quick to recognize that hundreds of thousands of women could not have been massacred and subjected to the cruelest tortures unless they posed a challenge to the power structure. They also realized that such a war against women, carried out over a period of at least two centuries, was a turning point. The original sin in the process of social degradation that women suffered with the advent of capitalism, and the phenomenon, therefore, to which we must continually return if we are to understand the misogyny that still characterizes institutional practice and male-female relations. We are to explain to a significant number of people what is wrong with the discourse that places pleasure and the body, in fundamental opposition to some notion of a legally constrained social responsibility. Rather than a discord that sees that pleasure and the body are constitutive elements of the social as much as our law and responsibility. Feeble-minded women, for example, were sent to the Virginia State Colony for confinement to ensure that they would not continue breathing. When Emma Bach arrived, she was cleaned and bathed, her clothes thrown away, and her genitals douched with mercury to disinfect. A repeat intelligence test performed by a psychiatrist confirmed the initial diagnosis of a low-grade moron. She was admitted to the colony. She would spend the rest of her lifetime in its confines. Our culture teaches us to focus on personal uniqueness, but at the deeper level, we barely exist as individual organisms. Our brains are built to help us function as members of a tribe. We are part of the tribe even when we are by ourselves, whether listening to music that other people create, Watching a basketball, basketball game on television, our own muscles tensing as the players run and jump. Most of our energy is devoted to connecting with others. They may not be your relatives. They may have never spoken your language. They may have been dead for a thousand years. They may have not been nothing but words printed on paper, ghosts of voices, shadows of minds. But they can guide you home. They are your human community. All of us have to learn how things in our lives make them up imagine. We need to be taught these skills. We need guides to show us how. Without them, our lives get made up for us by other people. Because everything that is known by the mind is an expression and reflection of its own limitations. Most minds forget their own limitations and project them instead onto whatever they know or perceive. This brings us to one of the most challenging ideas here. You need an emotion concept in order to experience or perceive an associated emotion. It's a requirement. Without a concept for fear, you cannot experience fear. Without a concept for sadness, you cannot perceive sadness in another person. 
You could learn the necessary concept or you could construct it in the moment through conceptual combination. But your brain must be able to make that concept and predict with it. Otherwise, you will be experientially blind to that emotion. I realize this idea might sound counterintuitive, so let's start with a few examples. Our brains are made so that we can only love a cat as a cat and not as a bird or as an elephant. If we want to love a cat, we want to see a cat touch its fur, hear it purr, and get scratched if we get our petting wrong. We don't want to hear it bark, and if the cat started growing feathers, we would kill, study, and finally exhibit it as a monster. I don't know why our brains are like that, but Kay has taught me that if we try to grow feathers without people expecting us to fly, they will shoot us from the sky and their dogs will shake us to make sure our necks are broken before we are chucked up into a bag and disposed of. Our brains can just about tolerate the cat with a missing tail or three legs, but any additions, Anything that I was not supposed to have been born with will never be accepted. And the cat that barks is a sea cat that spent too much time in the company of dogs. All the knowledge we have about the world acts like a shield, something we hold up against the world so as not to be overwhelmed by any impression. It's a practical strategy, and it isn't something we think about. It applies to everyone, presumably also to animals. We can't just feel. We have to live, too. Once in a while, we meet someone who pierces us. The people who change the room as they enter it. But professionally speaking, feeling stuck can stem from a fear of embarrassment, fear of censure of others for trying too hard, for being pretentious, for being blind to one's own positionality, fear of not getting it, of having missed the class in which the right references were handed out, fear of not having any right in the first place. And Lamont imagines an invisible panel of observers, superheroes, wearing impress me faces, poised ready to trip the writer up. First, there's the vinegar-lipped reader lady who says primly, well, that's not very interesting, is it? And there's the messy German man who writes these Orwellian memos detailing your thought crimes. And there are your parents agonizing over your lack of loyalty and discretion. And there's William Boros dozing off or shooting up because he finds his bold articulate as a house plan. But never trust an artist who does not possess a soft doubt. We are often taught we have no control over our feelings, yet most of us accept that we choose our actions and intention and will inform what we do. We also accept that our actions have consequences. To think of actions shaping feeling is one way we rid ourselves of conventionally accepted assumptions, such as that parents love their children, or that one simply falls in love without exercising will or choice, but there are such things as crimes of passion. When I began to write, I trembled with an almost immediately disappointed ambition, but I like paper and I like ink. This much remained constant, or at least recurrent. The ambition had to do with the hope for intimacy between sentences and sensation. I believed that my future was located in the flagrant interstices of this relation, that an architecture capable of welcoming my essential nudity would reveal itself on the threshold of the page. I needed to write in order to make a site for my body. Mobility, breadth, and impulse have already been so constricted by earlier layers of wrapping, those previous layers that doubled as protection and nourishment on the one hand, and restrictive social sanctions on the other, that you no longer have the dexterity or strength you would need in order to unwrap it. Immobilizing in a cocoon of commitments, expectations, demands, depths, obligations, dressing you in the need to fulfill them all successfully, and the desire for the rewards of doing which they promise. Because your conceptions of dexterity, impulse, breath, mobility, and our freedom have been so deeply conditioned by those earlier layers that it might no longer occur to you that there is anything to unravel. So successful social institutions draw your attention towards themselves and their successes and further away from the sprouting spool at your center. They devour your awareness. Everybody on earth knowing that beauty is beautiful makes ugliness. Everybody knowing that goodness is good makes wickedness. The smooth is the signature of the present time. It connects the sculpture of Jeff Koons, iPhones, and Brazilian waxing. Where do we today find that smooth is beautiful? Beyond its aesthetic effect, it reflects a general social imperative. It embodies today's society of positivity. What is smooth does not injure, nor does it offer any resistance. It's looking for light. The smooth object deletes it against. Any form of negativity is removed. A perverse dogma of our two architecture profession. A faith in a necessary connection between architectural greatness and originality. Architects came to be rewarded according to the uniqueness of their work, so that constructing a new house or office in a familiar form grew no less contemptible than plagiarizing a novel or poem. A day never passes without hearing our architects called upon to be original and to invent a new style. What could be more harmful 
and to believe that a new architecture is to be invented fresh every time we build. It is a pathetically outworn romantic notion that real artists emerge fully formed, having no traceable antecedents. The absurdity of this idea is apparent, and yet there are artists who claim this for themselves. I believe that ideas, once expressed, become the common property of all. They are invalid if not used. They can only be given away and cannot be stolen. Ideas of art become the vocabulary of art and are used by other artists to form their own ideas, even if unconsciously. I want to thank the opportunity. I want to thank for the opportunity to answer this wishes and speak. When we are capable of self-awareness, it's usually for very brief periods of time. The window of consciousness during which we can hold thought or work out a problem tends to be on average for roughly seven seconds. What neuroscientists, and it must be said, most contemporary philosophers almost never notice, however, is that a great exception to this is when we're talking to someone else. In conversation, we can hold thoughts for hours on end. This is, of course, why so often, even if we're trying to figure out something by ourselves, we imagine arguing it or explaining it to someone else. Human thought is inherently biological. And I imagine that for you, too, there must be a sentence, a paragraph, or a longer part of someone else's work that you feel you know well. You like it. You love it, Eva. Perhaps you don't. Perhaps it hurts you. But you are, nevertheless, for a complex of reasons, attached to it. Let's say that acts upon you. You find that it acts and has acted upon you. But it would appear that you have already also acted upon it. It addresses you. Or is it that you have made it address you? And now you love or are wounded, wounded by it because it addresses you, because it looks, reads, or sounds as if it was written for you. At some point in the process of becoming attached to the work, you have misrepresented the work to yourself. And now you have come to love your misrepresentation more. The thing that I now realize was happening during those years was a sort of tacking assessment of my own sensibilities. I was for the first time really sitting down and asking myself some hard questions about why I liked something one way or another. another. The very simple question that I asked myself about why there were so many arbitrary things in my paintings, it was just simply paying attention to my own sensibility and taking stock of it and deciding that too many things in there simply didn't make sense. Make sense on what basis? What, I did, I, what did I mean by making sense? I really didn't have a clear idea at the time. But I had developed a notion that if I spent long enough and allow myself to think about a particular idea hard enough, that I would begin to gain some awareness or some knowledge about it. I think that the mystery of fact is conveyed by an image being made out of non-rational marks. And you can't will this non-rationality of a mark. That is the reason that accident always has to enter into this activity, because the moment you know what to do, you're just making another form of illustration. Why, after the great artists, do people ever try to do anything again? Only because from generation to generation, to what the great artists have done, the instincts change. And as the instincts change, so there comes a renewal of the feeling of how can I remake this thing once again, more clearly, more exactly, more violently. I'm furious myself that you will, only, only, you will accept only partly that attitude. My opinion is that anything one does is all right, and I refuse to fight for this or that opinion or their contrary. Don't see any pessimism in my decisions. They are only a way towards the end. Your life has been and is connected with the actions and reactions of so many people that you can hardly approve of my choice. Please understand, I'm trying for a minimum of action, gradually. Oh, this is very annoying. The problem, I've said it before, I'm beginning to say it again, is figuring out how to occupy the time you're alive. It's better to occupy it than not to occupy it, as sometimes it can be so captivating that you forget that this narrow margin, this river, this trickle of water. Life is restricted to life. It's better to do what I do right than not to. It's better to do that than to do nothing. If you can do otherwise, for example, anything, perhaps it's better to do nothing. But don't think that the importance of what you do can change death's time. The sense of death that every being carries within them throughout their lives, cows, horses, men, imbeciles, geniuses, the absolute fear of what is absolutely unacceptable, the absolute disappearance of life. Why this fear, this terror of death? I think as an artist, so to speak, you have to accept that some part of you is going to die every time you make something that is worth making. That's where your skin is in the game. It's like the whole thing in the Iron Castle. He got where he needed to go, but by the time he got there, he didn't sit, and it, it, he didn't sit anymore. Because it took a toll. It takes a toll. That is, to me, the choice you make. If you go down this path, you know it's going to take a toll, but you don't always know what the toll is going to be. Like me, personally, I can't find a partner. That's what's destroying me. I can't find a partner. I have a lot of people in my life, a lot of love in my life a lot of friends and stuff like that, but 
I don't have a partner. I don't seem to be able to be able to find a partner, and I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know if I'm picking the wrong people. I'm bending over backwards. It just seems like I'm a little fearful that that's part of my path to be solo, which I'm not down with. I'm not happy about it. I haven't been able to fully enjoy a lot of my recent success because I don't feel like I have anybody to share it with. I'm happy. I love Gavin. He's great. I love Emily and Lucy. They're great. And I've got so many tight friends now, but just don't seem to be able to find a partner. It's wearing on me, man. It's really, really wearing on me. It's the one thing that really disturbs me about the whole thing. Because you could say, like, oh, yeah, you're an attractive guy. You're having all this success. You should be able to find a woman. But I just don't seem to be able to. It's disturbing as hell. In my grad school class, we were asked to say what the most important thing we've done in our lives. Everyone in the class, literally everyone, all 12 people, say that getting married was the most important thing. I want to say getting out of bed this morning. I want to say doing came with the case over the club in Queens this weekend when we locked ourselves in the singles user bathroom and peered at each other through either side of the legs of the chair that was in the corner, curled up in the floor, each of us saying how much our friendship was a monument, how we helped each other survive, survive blowing ketamine off of her cell phone and texting Robina and telling her to come to the club. Our came and we did more came and we all went back to Hazel's house and talked about the Cisco Hazel is dating who has only dated guys and how it feels fucked up to Hazel sometimes like she's worried that the girl relates to Hazel as a guy or relates to their relationship as a safe rather than real queer relationship because Hazel has a penis. Our got upset and was like, what's that wrong? And then Hazel got upset and then we all did some more and held each other. I wanted to tell my classmates that that was the most important thing that I had done in my life. And then walk out of the room. You know, we're, we're very impermanent. We are not here that long. And for an ephemeral action involving a fleeting substance documented by relatively marginal evidence, everything points to it not having been made to last. Except it did. So the notion of ambiguity must, excuse me, so the notion of ambiguity must not be confused with that of absurdity. To declare that existence is absurd is to deny that it can ever be given a meaning. To say that it's ambiguous is to assert that its meaning is never fixed, that it must constantly evolve. It is because man's condition is ambiguous that he seeks through failure and outrageousness to save its existence. In Plutarch Life, Clairefo rightly says that in war there is no victory which cannot be regarded as unsuccessful. So it is with any activity. Failure and successes are two aspects of reality which at the start are not perceptible. That is what makes criticism so easy and art so difficult. And it took me a long time, a very long time, to begin to realize that she was right and begin to realize that she meant what she meant. I, like all of us, thought I knew what I wanted, and I thought I knew who I was. Whatever one's journey is, one's got to accept the fact that disaster is one of the conditions under which you will make it. The journey may not make it in the American sense. And you will learn a certain humanity because the terms that you have invented, which you think describe and define you, inevitably collide with the facts of life. When this collision occurs, and make no mistake, this is an absolutely inevitable collision. When this collision occurs, like two trains meeting head on in a tunnel, life offers you the choice, and it's a very narrow choice, of holding on to your definition of yourself or saying, as the old folks used to say, and everybody wants to live has to say, yes to life. Okay, so um, what was that? So I, I mentioned it was a cover, and I will tell you in a second how I came about it. But basically, this was a collection of, uh, or, or let's say, for lack of a better word, maybe an essay that was made from other people's books. So it starts with Sartre uh, and Nausea, talks about and the entry of nothing existed. Um, the, the entry in the beginning um, is actually from Adra Lord's Cancer Journals, from them, from their going in a book called Come As You Are, which is, which is all about sexuality and orgasms, talking about the evolution of beauty, so playing with this notion of, of the body, and from their transition to say, we are heart man, and the reality of a body, and the politics around any body, um, said we are heart man, and um, um, I'm missing the other one's name, but we have them all in the end. I can show you that. Times Square Red, Times Square Blue, again, um, someone already Laney talking about the body and, and the politics of the body. Um, excerpts from a book called uh, The Gene to 
the body gives the score, so exploring a little bit more, okay, but what is the body then? If it, if it became so politicized, what's the reality of it? Uh, a book that was super important to me, and I'll mention it a little bit later again, called uh, Emotions as Social, uh, How Emotions Are Made, that talks about the reality and recent discoveries in neuroscience and, and then actually understanding, okay, but what are these things? What are these things called feelings? What are these processes? Um, and so on and so forth. And, and there's a few games happening here at the same time. You can always see it's always a left side, it's always a, a left side or the left page combined with the right page. Um, there's no duplicates from, from more books. And trying to create this sort of meandering thought of uh, train of thought from, from all these people's voices. This happened all by accident, and it was really just excerpts that kind of stayed with me from different books. Adrian Piper talking about the rapping. Um, a few more, maybe, um, the recognized architecture of happiness. Or so Louis being complaining about uh, oh, then, yeah, no way. <laughs> fighting back on the claims that he would be copying other people's work um, to um, um, yeah to to Robert Irwin's uh, quote from seeing is forgetting of the name of seas and so on and so forth. So talking then about creation and what the reality is or what the connection is between the physicality, the body, the mind, and how we create things, how we relate to things, how we relate to others. And ultimately, this after the turmoil of maybe creation, this reality of uh, coming back to the reality of what does it actually mean to be alive, as most artists uh, will, will at one point come, come to terms with that. Uh, incredible excerpt from Hannah Baer's um, book two, ending with Timon the Barbour. So here you can see the entire the entire list of books. So this was a cover that happened that I came across in a way, or that happened to me. Happened to me as things happened to me um, by 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 accident because what I was actually asked to do was a chair. And um, there, this was during the pandemic, and it was for a gallery here in New York, in LA. And um, it was in pandemic, because so I thought one of the nicest things that you could gift or exhibit or share with the world is something that you do yourself, something done with your two hands, something that speaks to someone else, but also something that isn't stable, that isn't just singular and isolating in those times of intense isolation already. So I, okay, yeah. So um, I basically was, I was trying to actually make a bed out of health for my dog. We did not appreciate the bed, but uh, I really got into felt. Um, so I made this this stack of felt circles that I cut myself, one cent centimeter thick wool felt, um, and it was called one to forty seats for one to eighty people in the idea that it's something that's endlessly shareable between a shorter person and a taller person, or forty people, or so on and so forth. And in doing that, it was it, this was fall of twenty twenty. You know, twenty twenty was a very intense year. Um, I I don't know about you, but I know a lot of that year was spent in my head and in, in books too. And so I wanted to add reading materials. I thought, okay, if we share this chair and you kind of open it, what if you don't, you find there's something to actually read on? And that's when the whole thing derailed and this kind of <laughs> started uh, becoming a thing. And what, you know, do we call it a cover? Is it a cover or is it not a cover? So on this notion of covers, um, so it's a bit slow. Um, uh, uh, we can I can run you through a couple of, of covers, and and again we can verify what what works or what doesn't work in covers. There's a, there's basically what we have identified as two trains of thought in relation to cover. There's people who consider a cover only something that becomes authentic on its own right, so creating authentic work based on existing authentic. And then there's other people who want to claim the notion of cover as an absolute umbrella, almost as a spectrum, spectrum going all the way from mimicking covers, so the cover bands that we're more familiar with, to, to referential covers, so uh, transformative being in the middle of referential covers, really referencing as something existing but not necessarily uh, fully depending on it. So there's different ways of, of thinking about it. Uh, to. The quote on the left side from Coco Chanel is attributed to very many other people too, um, which is kind of funny. And um, Borges' quote is actually someone else quoting. Borges was quoting Francis Bacon's essays at the 
and with the lecture at Harvard, he's saying all novelty is nothing by, by oblivion, but oblivion. And I recently came across uh, uh, Laura Caesar's quote too, saying that uh, to begin with the obsession of originality is an unrefined and rudimentary process. But outside of the, those aspects, there's something just very interesting and playful in it. And for me, the way the what opened this this portal, for lack of a better word, is um, was this cover on the right side, Cat Powers' cover of I Can Get No Satisfaction. Um, if you haven't listened to it, I really encourage you to, but it was years of enjoying this song just to realize one day walking down the street that she never says the song. She, the, the, the words, she never says, I can get no satisfaction. She doesn't use the word satisfaction. She doesn't say any of it. And yet you somehow know that it's a cover of that song. Although the melody is different, the rest of the lyrics are identical, but still there's something that she's able to kind of maintain this connection to the original. And I thought that was incredibly moving and powerful, both as a creative practice, um, but, but as, a, as a feat of sorts. Of course, she has many albums dealing with covers or just focusing on covers. For example, uh, the recent um, album on Dylan covers. I thought this quote was really powerful where she talks about the process. So she says, I think it's like when archaeologists are uncovering the bones of some ancient animal. There's a certain amount of responsibility with the bones, you know. I mean, there's probably a certain joy in being an archaeologist and finding those bones. And it's valuable for you as a scientist, but as an artist, Finding those bones or that gold in songwriting, growing up with different songs speaking to you, and finding that one thing that strikes you very personal, psycho spiritual, and whatever, and wanting to sing it, all that comes from feeling like it's gold and wanting to share it and to do right by it. So, it is this question of doing it right by it. I think these are some of the questions in our mind. So, if you think of them as covers, which again, there's many, many directions in which they can be interpreted. Um, we recognize the process in film, one example being a bigger splash in the swimming pool. Um, one of my favorites, just uh, both film and sound, I guess, in this case, uh, Stanley Kubrick's Space Odyssey with The Simpsons. Um, in fashion, we're, uh, again, it's a very accepted, recognized process, however one wants to think of it. Most recent with Bonner. Or uh, things like the tab issues that uh, Margiela came to be identified in quite a lot in the Western world, when of course it's a very traditional way of making shoes. Another side to it, or another example, is something like this the Glasgow Airport identity done in the 60s by Margaret Calvert. And, and the very um, fortunate and intelligent being used and deployment of something that just isn't existing anymore. By, by Virgil Abloh as the off-white identity. There's a resourcefulness in, in, this, in, in this premise that, that, um, that I'm particularly interested in. There's a resourcefulness and a humbleness in it too. Alvar Alto's Tool 60, reinterpreted in the 2000s by Erhard Frick, what's interesting is actually wood is not really, the, the flexi is a lot more in sync as materiality. Uh, for this kind of shape than Alvar Alto's, where it takes a lot of effort to, to laminate and bend the wood to achieve Alvar Alto's design, and then you have, of course, the uh, IKEA version. Kara Walker with Fonts Americanos uh, covering, if you may, the Queen Victoria Memorial here in, in, in LA. I keep saying here in New York, I'm sorry. I'm very happy. Um, Noah Davis is uh, the Underground Museum imitation of well. Sir Robert Smith, uh, Smith and one of my favorite is David Hammond's shoe tree. Uh, there's another version of this where he's getting a fine for peeing on it too, and there's documentation of it. All of them um, valuable art artworks. Uh, and uh, as oftentimes it's the case, especially in in music. The covers become really uh, more famous than the original. Uh, it's true for Erika Franklin, RSPCT. Um, here, I think I leave it to everyone to decide where they stand. But we have Joy Division and uh, Alive She Died, Eileen Gray covered by Tom Sachs. And it happens in architecture too, but we oftentimes lack the, maybe the language or vocabulary or just the pressure to, to allow ourselves to talk about it in those ways. This is one of my favorite examples that I um, 
on the left side, the ground one recognize the Sea Green building, but on the right side, there's a, a so called museum plaza built in the 60s and 70s in Dublin. And um, on the architect's website, I mean, they, they, they chose to call it museum plaza and they described it as an homage to the Sea Green building. But I thought it was a very rare and very nice example in which it begs the question, why not? Why wouldn't you take something that's good? And why not? And we said zero if you didn't involve me in any of it. Um, and from what I understand, it's a space that is um, celebrated or seems to be doing well or working. Uh, and another example of between La Cotton Vassal and, and something fantastic. If there's any interesting sites, maybe one aspect that was brought up in the context of music circular back and forth is uh, that, that one of the maybe theories or one of the assumptions is that people really like covers because they also anticipate something happening and they're curious to see what the cover artist is really making of it. I think it's an interesting duality. It doesn't exist, something exists not only on its own, which for many maybe they don't want to see that's how you encounter it. But for other people, it can really just be about the play and the relationship to the to the original. Um, like I said, in architecture, we don't really have this sort of language or permission. Um, a lot of the conversations in the studio too were, uh, what's the difference between this and precedent study? And one thing that came about, one of the things that was mentioned was uh, feeling. Um, someone said they were not allowed, or maybe the question of feelings did not come in in the discussion around precedent studies. But similarly, when I had uh, run this the previous sort of reading by someone re recently by Frederick and Thomas Hall, he also we also were discussing okay, what makes a cover, what doesn't make a cover, and where is the difference? And again, this question of feeling came up, which I thought was quite powerful, saying okay, it's what you feel when you experience this new thing, whatever it is. It's the feeling that. This is one of my um, older projects, and um, again, in the context of architecture, it's something that oftentimes um, people brought up. Sun Hour said it was it was a, a reference, or however you want to call it, which I very much considered an, an, um, a compliment, of course, uh, whether it's about this bridge or, or this tool, knowing that I can't really think of um, any Sun Hour project that looks quite like that in the same time. So I think it's, it's uh, interesting conversations that happen to that. But I think what I'm mostly interested in, can we allow ourselves to think a little bit differently about our relationship, our position in the world, our relationship to ideas, our relationships to other people's work, and, and so on and so forth. And if you just indulge me for another second, um, I'm, I'm, I'll, I, want, I want to tell you where I'm, where I'm going with this. Um, so, Maybe you heard it a couple of years ago, 2018, it's more than a couple of years, but you know what I mean. Um, there was an article in the New York Times where they said a new, a new organ had been discovered. Some people disagree, is it really an organ or is it not? But basically, they, it was discovered for the first time that uh, this, this uh, substantial amount of space in our body is actually a continuous, um, a continuous, organ, I would call it. And what's interesting about it is they said no, no one saw these spaces before because of the medical field's dependence on the examination of fixed tissue on microscope slides, believed to offer the most accurate view of, view of biological reality. This fixation artifact of collapse has made fluid-filled tissue type throughout the body appear solid in biopsy slides for decades, and our results correct this to expand the anatomy of tissue. So really what it means is um, is that, every, you know, in this particular case, Dr. Neil Thies, he, he, he describes how, how, why they found it, and basically they're saying everything we know about the body is a reflection of the methods we used to examine. If I had been looking at the interstitial for 30 years and I've never really known this is before, partially because of the reality of how we look at the thing. And what he was describing earlier is as they were taking these samples of the body, the fluid was, of course, not transferring under the microscope, and therefore it was never, never recognized as such. What you see here in this really powerful images is um, the way they tested this is really by tattooing someone and then seeing how those small pigments travel through the entire body. And so they find them in weird places in the body, really concluding that this is really um, 
a very continuous uh, liquid. It's basically, they, they call it a fluid 3D lattice work of collagen and elastin, connective tissue that can be found all over the body in or near our lungs, skin, digestive tract, and arteries. And, and so you, um, and um, the other thing that I thought was quite compelling, this is a picture of it, what you see at the top. It's quite hard to imagine. I think it's also very typical than the usual way of looking at, at bodies or understanding bodies. But um, I thought this photo of this, this interstitium could act as a shock, shock, shock absorber for other parts of the body. It's fluid, something that ebbs and flows, like the ocean. It is similarly underexplored. But the fact that it's not fixed and it flows and it's in between these other things did not allow it to, to be perceived. I thought that's really kind of fascinating and has to do a little bit with how we choose to see, uh, to look at certain things. And a lot of this kind of maybe weird interest in, in the body and, and some of these um, other conversations really come from a period of my life where I was subjected to some of these exercises. This is TMI, I recognize that, but I just still, still find it fascinating. And, I mean, it, it's kind of a powerful experience to be subjected to such things and to kind of recognize just how basic we are <laughs> and how little we actually know about, about ourselves, about how we function as bodies. <coughs> and everyone who's been through um, medical procedures, unfortunately, quite often realizes the kind of limits to our knowledge. But that really kind of, I found actually wildly exciting to understand the most basic terms, just the miracle of life and what's so special it is considering how, how complex and simple in many ways our existence is, that we're capable to laugh, to love, not to mention inventing concepts and making buildings and talking for hours about buildings and so on and so forth. Um, so I mentioned previously this book, this brings me to Lisa Feldman Ferret's How Emotions Are Made. And one of the parts that really stuck with there is she describes how she talks about body, but how the bodies are constantly budgeting their energy. Um, and they're saying when you interact with your friends, parents, children, lovers, teammates, therapists, or other close companions, you and they synchronize breathing, heartbeats, and other physical signals leading to tangible benefits. When you lose a close loving relationship and feel physically ill about it, part of the reason is that your loved one is no longer helping you regulate your body. You feel like you've lost a part of yourself because in a sense you have. So that really just made me wonder and beg this question if if oceans like like the interstitium can be found within our bodies and if we know that our bodies and bodies that are in the same room do communicate and share and sing their heartbeats and, and, and sing many other aspects of themselves. What if the space between us is also an ocean that ebbs back and flow? What if there's not nothing? What if there's not what we call air? But what if there's possibility for more? Eastern cultures are a lot more open towards that. The key is it's known that it actually goes outside of the body. But, but it's really this sort of perspective that I'm trying to narrow, uh, narrow in and I just ask in many ways is, yeah, can we, can we relate to one another differently in order to also uh, maybe shape the world around us with slightly different intentions? Thank you. I'll get us started, but I must confess I don't have a fully formulated question. But I would say, um, in thinking back about what I was trying to say with the introduction and thinking about the sort of the relational project, and um, as you were talking when you started, I obviously have no idea how you had structured your presentation even though you very honestly said that the relationship between what you were saying and the images was non-existent, I was like, well, there is something that emerges by either accidentally, purposefully connecting them. 
And as you went from format to format, from reference to reference, and now having seen your whole presentation, everything kind of sort of comes together as something that makes sense, that is coherent, uh, that still provokes, that gives answers, but also leaves sort of very open-ended um, sort of threads um, and lands. And I always love that about your work and the way you present your work, the way you critique the work of others, how your students, students present their work, at least from what I've um, had a chance to see. Um, so I'm gonna, again, maybe there's not a question here, but I thought the entire performance and also fragments of it work not so differently from a collage. And uh, maybe I'm just trying to make sense of it and bring it back to an architectural operation that feels familiar and comfortable and non-threatening and things like that. But that has produced a lot of very interesting work, sort of the exercise of just opposing radically different things, whether those are formats or ideas or forms or styles, has been proven a very effective technique, both of art and of architecture, to provoke and to set the stage for new knowledge. And I thought you did that beautifully. Um, so I was um, I was thinking about the difference between collage and montage, not as elaborated by me, but somebody like Stanan, right? What seamlessly merges into a new type of thing versus what purposefully stays separated. So I'm going to be thinking about this and trying to figure that out. I don't think I need to ask if you're interested in collage because that's not the question. I just wanted to share sort of my first reaction um, to these and give time to everybody in the room <laughs> to come up with their questions as well. Thank you, Anna. That was super interesting. Thank you. That was not a closing call. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? You know, it's interesting to hear that. I know what makes sense to me on the inside, but once you try to externalize it, we all try to do this. It's a lot of fun. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, great, great talk. Thank you so much. Um, I'm interested in the idea of covers versus remixes, mm -hmm. or like in music, maybe a remix accompanies an album release where musicians get the original stems of the songs versus sometimes covers are made where the person covering the song has no relationship at all with the actual artist and mm -hmm. so kind of an open-ended question but just interested in your thoughts on that as it relates to the architecture and everything you're speaking about yeah i mean in relation to architecture i think it was mr alexander was saying that um you know, we don't, we don't really have the vernacular anymore, and the vernacular is really adaptation and repetition, which maybe comes closer to remix uh, than, let's say, a cover, how we typically think about it, right? And instead, we have this sort of intense focus on, on the original. And I, I oftentimes think it's ironic because architecture, if you want to think of it as an art form, or at least those aspects, are really considered some of the most, I'm totally going to do this, by the way, but I'll come back to the remix. Um, it is one of the most limited of, of art forms, right? But maybe I wonder if partially because of that, it is also so subjective to this pressure of the original. I mean, it's not the only thing, it's also the thing that's boxed and being sold in ways uh, like most of us are <laughs> these days or everything is these days. Um, but then I think it's not really that because then I think of the Mrs. Scott Brown uh, essay, Woman at the Top, which if you've read, you read, it's really, really amazing and completely valid, unfortunately. 40 years uh, later, but she asks why this architect and why these men at the time. The whole article is about why she's written out of things. Um, and um, one thing she says is because uh, she tries to find read the under she tries to understand the, why that happens in such an organic form in press in all personal matters and so on and so forth. And um, anyway, the short of it is she says it's partially because, or she identifies this notion of the, what she calls unmeasurables in architecture. And that most things that have an unmeasurable dimension uh, require the idea of the mystic, of this person that has powers that are greater than everyone else. It's almost like you want to be sure, you want to be able to trust that someone understands that or controls this dimension of the unmeasurables. And that's why we need the, this, this idea of the, the myth of the, of the 
this and she said it's a little bit like having the water main on top of the of the boat it's a little bit like having the start in that which is a pretty good analogy um but back to the remix i mean i think what i the reason i kind of stayed with covers versus remix or bootleg or or any of the other iterations of copy or collateral um they they tend to come with certain baggage and i feel covers maybe i'm ruining it now for people but um, it does, it's a bit mischievous and it, it has, it just doesn't have that negativity. And I think the immediate response is everyone will send you like videos of covers, which, which is great. But it, it has that sort of immediate visceral reaction and, and not so much baggage. But now, of course, the, what we're, what, where, how far one wants to stretch this notion is, is completely up to, I think it's, it's kind of fair game. And I think that's what we're exploring at the Biennial in Trial. <laughs> um, that's what we're what we're trying to to explore. Quite, we're going pretty, I think, extreme with it. Um, translations between different. I'm trying to not give too much away, but translations between different disciplines, for example, or, or things like that. Um, yeah. Any questions? Yeah. 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 Hello. Um, my question is a two-part question because in my perception of your presentation, it has a kind of duality where it starts with this idea of referencing. However you want to talk about referencing, if that's covers, if that's sampling, if that's remixing, um, and the intentionality of referencing and the unintentionality of referencing in terms of your influences and how that comes into your work, or are you directly borrowing for someone as a generative tool? Um, and so I would ask how that how, how has that affected your work, the intentionality of references, and secondarily, the second part of the presentation, in my view, talks about this invisible force that connects all of these different operations to make a whole. Um, and when you talk, when usually uh, in different rhetoric or literature about spirituality talks about this invisible life force, right? even in sci-fi. Um, and so how is this invisible force that ties things together, that gives things life, also has affected your work? work. So how does the reference and how has the invisible force uh, affected your work and how do you see your, uh, it affected your work moving forward? And thank you. They're both good questions. So I think the first one, not so much in a conscious way, but I remember this uh, one moment when I was working in an office and this is starting thing. Um, but in the process of, uh, of design for a specific house, uh, they had reached this moment where the project looked like someone else's work. And all the interns and everyone on the project was freaking out. Like, oh my god, we're doing these other people's work. It's like the end of the world. The only person who didn't care was the person in charge because they kind of saw it as a stepping stone in the process. Like they just didn't let themselves be unfazed um, and disconsider something just because it looked like something else. When of course there's so much of that. Sort of just kept going. I think this is probably the closest that I could answer the first question in the sense that it's not so much a conscious conscious necessarily seeking. I think if the seeking comes, it comes from other fields more so than architecture. Um, but it's not being afraid of something looking like or having or speaking to to that. So I think it's more in that realm. Um, the life force thing, I'm not sure that I know how to, but I want to I wanna know more about it. So I'm not sure how uh, how to necessarily answer. I think just in terms of my own trajectory around it. So you know I studied architecture and then worked in a bunch of offices which was my way of getting a second degree. So I had to learn how architecture is being done, especially outside of Romania. To kind of get to a point where like okay now what do i want to do how do i want to go about it and then i tried certain things for a certain while and then i also had uh, was going through some things like the healthcare and everything and i think i mean what you see here is the really just the result of these years of seeking a different way of operating it was also in these years that for the first time working in many offices and, and it was great to learn how to make architecture but in the same time there were parts of me that had to stay home so for me, it was a constant pursuit. I mean, I really just, in many ways, I'm really just a toddler trying to kind of crave more freedom for to make something of all these things that I've learned. And, and really, it's kind of 
I think it was in my mid thirties or something like that, where I found ways to, or where I saw everything being actually a little bit more interconnected than I was allowing myself to see before. And that was mind blowing because it's like, oh, there's ways of bringing these things in, however direct or indirect, it almost doesn't matter. Um, but it made me, it, it was like opening a door where like, wow, this is actually possible. Like all these different aspects of, that interest me, they don't have to be removed or separated, they can be interwoven. Um, so it's been just a pursuit of, of to that end. I mean, uh, I always find this sound, it sounds a little bit pretentious, but one thing that I've been seeking and trying to, I ha I've had an office and as part of family for a long time, but I knew I also didn't do all of those things to just run another architecture office. It just wasn't the thing that I was seeking. Um, and so instead of the rock band scenario that we're so familiar with in architecture, I'm trying to see if um, how far can I push it? Can it be more of a jazz scenario where you have different people coming in and coming in and everyone depends on everyone else being in the ensemble, but you're not in a fixed configuration and tied to that. I don't know if any of this answers what you're, <laughs> what you're asking, but yeah, thank you. Hi, um, I just have a quick question, but I really appreciate your talk because for me, it kind of uh, clarified some things that I've been thinking about, including like um, there's the binary, like the good and the bad, and like every way that I'm obsessed with kind of getting away from that and answering like questions of arch architectural questions that aren't involved with that, especially like as you said, the vernac like the vernacular that we have is like not it's gone. Um, so like what's left and like what's left is like these adaptations with remixes that you mentioned. Um, and for me, like you brought, you kind of answered this like question where authenticity and like vulnerability are like a huge part of addressing that binary. And so I guess I'm wondering, or like in the future, like how to work in the future. And I guess I'm just like wondering if that's like a misreading or if you like have more to say about like that kind of authenticity and vulnerability that you were kind of addressing um, through like being authentic yourself as you work and as you are authentic to those feelings that I guess that you're mentioning. Yeah. It's, like, it's a deeply personal process that like you're constantly like expressing and externalizing and like that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's actually quite a good reading in the sense of I always find whether in architecture or any other place that when you're presented with binaries, something is, it's the wrong question and definitely the wrong options in there. I mean, that's why also in the, in that reading, it was it as it starts with women and all those things, like it really kind of goes in a different place and tries to undo a lot of that too. And what I'm always interested in, in that too is, is, I mean, I'm, I'm, there's so many sides to it, but I think I'm most interested in pushing myself. And pushing myself means making myself uncomfortable and, and so on and so forth. So I understand like the, the part with, for example, with I can't find a partner and all of that. That's Arthur Jacob talking about uh, something in a completely different context. And I love it just for that because you don't hear uh, successful artists, male artists saying that. And you hear me here with my accents. But for now, I get it. <laughs> like that's a, that, to me, that's, the, that's part of the game, right? And from there it goes into. But, but I, we all have these biases and we all have like, you know, I, I always think like for considering how little we know how our brains work, we take them surprisingly serious. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm really just trying to stay open in many ways, because I think especially as you're moving forward, the, the reflex tends to be to close off and to close the circle off in many different ways. And, and, and yeah, um, I, I don't know if that, if that really answers it, but it is really just a, a refusal to a certain degree to to compromise, maybe? I mean, I don't know if it's to, to compromise, but it's just trying to seek something else because I think what I find and, and really just pursue the things that I'm interested in. I'm saying that too because, of course, we are in a particular moment right now in the world, and maybe every generation has its its particular moments, um, but this one's kind of intense, and, and I think you have the chance to really take it seriously or not, to kind of make something of it or not. And so, yeah, but that's all to say that, you know, I'm also trying to 
from trying to find language that doesn't make it sound contrived or, or corny. But um, I'm trying to find these spots that I can thrive in and kind of, you know, it's, I was apologizing to Marianne at the beginning of the lecture without telling her why, which was like, I'm not going to show anything, um, which I could have done, but you can find it, it online. Like, I don't really need to do that again and I don't need to repeat myself. Um, either and and if you would have told me this ten years ago, I wouldn't have been able to sit here and, and even attempt to do this. So it's it's kind of little personal victories for me, but or not. We'll see. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but let's also say that I feel oftentimes like you know in the context of an of an audience or interactions with the public. I think the other way of looking at it. I also try to put things out there that kind of speak to the kind of things that I want to come back to me. And I think that the, the idea of the ebb and flow and the ocean, and, and I understand and any human relationship and interaction, they're hard, they're not easy. But again, I think we're, so the pressures are so strong against that, and they're so strong to isolate, to keep people apart, to, um, and, and, and so, the more specific you make a, a project or something or whatever, the, the bigger chances that it will speak to more specific to a larger audience, actually. Like if you try to vanilla it and say everything to everyone, it's going to end up nowhere. So, yeah, but, but it's all new. Yeah, I don't really know what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about um, the moral or ethical sort of components of cover, which I think, you know, inevitably, you know, has some kind of homage or kind of acknowledgement of the author versus sampling or in, yeah. any other kind of form of art. And just wondering how that fits into your kind of, I don't know, your yeah. borrowing of the idea of cover. Thank you. That's a very good question. Um, and so, you know, on the one hand, I really like solo with stuff with ideas are free, and, and of course they, they should circulate. Um, and I feel it's a manner. It's a little bit like we're cultural appropriation too. It's a matter of a power dynamic and who benefits of what. Um, because yes, ideas should be protected, and yes, uh, the creative should live from them. But do I believe in a completely litigious society where we're going to sue every over every square inch? Or in a way, it begs this question of what's actually, you know, I oftentimes think with certain projects or ideas, if for me, the, the way I look at it sometimes, it's like, wouldn't have been, wouldn't the world have been sadder if we wouldn't have had this? Like, is this any true harm or not? So uh, trying to negotiate that line between a responsibility in doing certain things, but also acknowledging that oftentimes the original, at least in architecture, does not come from anywhere, like from nothing either, right? So there's a lineage, um, a lineage there. Um, yeah. So it, it, it's a it's a fine line, but I think that's where interesting nature room is for for accidents. I mean, also not. Um, Proposing necessary, necessary. <laughs> well, okay. So in the studio, which you, you all should join us for mid review next uh, Thursday, uh, we're looking at the case study houses. That's what we started with. So then, the question would be, what? How can you cover them? How? Where do you go with that? And and it's interesting too because I feel in architecture, every small project is so complex and site specific. But I do feel if one was to be serious about it, or if I was to be serious about it, and was to try to draw, not the referential stuff, but really try to identify elements and sort of classify them as covers or not, I think we'd have a pretty giant catalog. I think unfortunately most people would be offended at, at, about it rather than, rather than embrace it. Uh, but we were joined last week by, uh, by a lawyer, Irina Rice, who works in an architecture office and presented with the whole kind of legal framework of this conversation of, of copyright and fair use and uh, original and, and so on and so forth. And it's, it's really interesting because the, the line there is like, what would if the line in terms of what you can, um, let's say copyright or what, what should be fair use, it's like, can can you make it, does it make the world better? Can the public benefit? So let, that's, that's considered a fine line, which of course like anything in law is very great. 
Uh, how do you define originality? Because um, I think in your logic, um, if anything has a precedent, it's a cover. But I think if you go down that logic, everything in the world is a cover. Like all the artwork, you know, if I look at a body and make a sculpture, that's a cover. Especially in the last part, you said everything is kind of connected. So I guess you talk a lot. You talk a lot about cover, but I want to ask you at first, how do you define original? I, I don't think I said that everything that is has a precedent is a cover. So just just saying, I think I, I, I'm thinking of them more as, as questions than, than answers. And I think some of these things need to be, be defined by each and every one. I mean, my favorite way of looking at covers is without, any, without there ever being an original present. Sort of in its most extreme forms, it acknowledges that everything is built on something else. If you really want to tie it to the building blocks, and uh, and I, of course this isn't a, a this will never be a legal per, uh, perspective, but it's also how our brain works. We're only able to do something based on what we know in our experience, and of course that doesn't mean there is nothing original. Um, I think I'm just trying to to me what's original or what's not. It's less of a I think as a question, it's not that interesting to me, or like I'm trying, and of course I wonder sometimes or compact it, uh, or, or even the, the authentic, I think this question for me that made it powerful was, can you create something authentic, so something that stands on its own two lines, that's to me a lot more powerful than based on something else authentic. So what does that authenticity mean to one? How do you really make something that has its own value? If you, if you do so, whether it comes directly as a cover, whether it speaks to something else directly or not, it, it, it's sort of, uh, I think, irrelevant in the, in the big picture. But I think what I want to ask for, what I'm trying to find both in myself and in, in people around me is just a different take towards the original and not, sort of not putting this entire baggage onto some mythical and absurd or yeah uh, dimension and instead uh, making room for maybe a different perspective um, onto it just because I don't find it to be particularly productive and I think LA is a very good place where we see a lot of that unfolding. I think it's fascinating too that as a question sorry for me. but I think as a question it's also very interesting because it really rides people up that you would challenge the original and um, and I'm all for that. I mean, I believe in beautiful and powerful ideas, but uh, but the, the focus right now is more on things, people and ideas fitting neatly into boxes rather than the fluidity of, of our lives and processes. So we have another half quarter to discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good question. Um, I mean, I, I loved the uh, ECM Plaza. I mean, it, like, it, what was so great about it was exactly what you said, that it was, it was like, it, you, um, the architect brought an original idea to something that was uh, you know, fully known. So like compared to all of the Nicene architecture that we see that pays homage to, to Nice, it, it's like, it's clear that that kind of architecture drank from the same Kool-Aid. Like the whole ideology of the architecture is is embedded in in the in their account work. Whereas like if you say Nisian Plaza, it already assumes that you have a distance from that ideology and you're looking at it and you're seeing it in a new way that you went before. And I, I feel like what you're saying about covers is exactly that. That it's this new insight that, that can be continually drawn from something that has, that we all see. I don't know you, how you feel about that, but for, yeah. or, I don't know, could, could you respond to that? Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, that's why I, what I enjoy about this is I get <laughs> actual valuable questions and feedback. Um, yeah, I, I think I think that's it in many ways, right? Like when you, not having studied here, I find sometimes in, 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 in the US there's a very specific vocabulary to architecture and, and baggage, and that's foreign to me, so I need to kind of find ways to to understand some of those things, but then I'm trying to also, uh, it's, it's just an outsider's perspective. 
And then so I, I don't have the same, uh, rep, not reverence, but sort of relationship to some of those things, which makes it easier to just try to find different ways in to the into the problem. Um, but really, just as a premise, now I, it's it's accepted, it's it's uh, recognized in the music. Why why can't it be in other fields too? But I think it also begs this very basic and different question of what are we building in twenty twenty four? Are we building? Are we still building? And if so, what? What should be the starting point of, of that? And is it still? And and you know, there's many parallel worlds in this world. So I think everyone has to answer some of those questions for themselves. But I know an entire young generation is probably wondering that. And and, and yeah, that, that's that's part of it too. And if, yeah, the other thing that's slightly weird to speak to that is. I, I come from practice and I love design and talk with Marianne a lot about it. Like ultimately that's like part of what we know how to do, what I know how to do and what I have to contribute. But somehow these conversations or this thing is to me they're in, completely interrelated and they're just trying to there's just ways of trying to find um, to hold myself accountable and responsible and responsible. It's just trying to articulate these things that are something somewhat somewhat in the ether. I think partially too because I find my generation, like we're not in our 20s anymore. So we carry a bit of responsibility, right? At the beginning, you were kind of angry at the world you're inheriting. Halfway through, you become responsible for it. So I'm trying to to find my own my own place within that and my own role. And then this question of, okay, but what are we building now? And where do we stand on that? And it's, I think it's a deeply personal question at the end of the day. Hi. Uh, sorry. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I, as I was listening to you, I saw like a thematic gesture and merge of like splicing. Um, in the beginning, when you were talking, you were performing your cover, your book, the video was spliced together of like different um, pathways and movements. And then we learned that like the book was spliced together um, in half and in a series of halves. And the chair was stackable and sliced. Um, and then like we kind of ended with with the tissue, but before that you had this like incredible like body scan of just like slicing you up <laughs> in front of us. But uh, like at the end of your conversation, you talked about like the the space that exists outside of you. Um, and I'm just wondering like the gesture that emerged, like, does that take on that space and like have you found like physicality to like this gesture of like um exploring yeah i don't know <laughs> like what is the cover is physicality i guess i mean i don't know how to answer any of that but i appreciate the splicing <laughs> and the reading of the splicing it's interesting it feels like therapy like okay give me more it's healthy um but uh, what i find particularly uh, interesting about some of the things that you were saying. I mean, this I had written a text, someone had commissioned me to write something short, and it was in the pandemic again, and I just, it, I just titled it Under the Influence. And it had nothing to do with before the book or any of that stuff. And it was, it was because there was this moment in time, and I think I still have it, where I have these friendships and collaborators and friends and these meaningful connections that, you know, when you have productive conversations or dialogues and sometimes you're not even sure well, well where where did that come from was it my idea did i pass it on to to him or them and then they give did they give it back not that it would necessarily matter but somehow you sometimes lose your friend you lose yourself in some of the people around you and i thought that was incredibly beautiful and i thought okay but there is a physical reality to this too which is just that of how body synchronize and, and all of that and 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 if you just think about it, it's freaking miraculous. But we don't think about it in many ways, maybe because we can't afford it not to think about it. Like there's one of the lines in the text that says, "You have to, you can't just keep feeling; you have to live too." Um, so, but so that's to say that that, that notion of the exterior is on its part is is comes from from there in many ways, where the distance does not isn't. Um, I mean, it comes also from just looking at the world in general. What if you think of 
there is no nothing, right? The kind of cumulative amount of material and atoms are sort of the same. So it is, is can you not be destructive? And can that change the way you think, the thoughtfulness that you put into anyone or anything? Um, yeah. We're gonna take two more questions there from here. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, so I grew up playing and performing jazz music. Uh, and this notion of a cover, I think, is really almost foreign to jazz. Yeah. Um, in jazz, there's a spirit of uh, performing and borrowing, and it's not so much playing a cover as it is performing a standard. Yeah. Um, that said, there is a caveat where there, you know, there's a saying where if you're going to take something or borrow something, whether it's a chord progression or the chorus or an individual lick, that you should do it better. Um, so I guess the, the question is, well, I guess I'll, I'll start with uh, a quote that I like, which is, uh, in art, if you're going to say something, you say something with five words. Uh, if in that you reference another piece, as art is often referential, and that piece has five words, well, now you have 10 words. So the, the question is, is it possible to see architecture, like musicians see jazz, um, like not as stealing or borrowing, but as uh, like participating or playing the game? Yeah. <laughs> yes, please. I hope so. I, I appreciate you saying that, that it's a very uh, uh, good observation. When we're reading on the lineage of, of covers, it's associated oftentimes with rock. And basically, the meaning um, before rock, there are, were no covers because everyone would perform the song. The song was the object in a way, not the performer. And so, with rock and Elvis and all of that, the performer and his authenticity became more about the best of the performer rather than, than the song. And, and so, there's a, there's a substantial amount of literature claiming that you only have covers in rock or maybe pop. But not jazz, like you're saying, because the performance is what matters. And and I think that's what I'm seeking some of what, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side. From outside, it looks really nice and easy. But there's a fluidity to the process from, from what I understand um, that I, I seek and that I wonder why it would be possible. I mean, I remember working with some musicians who sometimes would, on their songs, they would have 10 different people, and they would try to put two, three, four architects around the table, and they were so frustrated that it would never work out. We don't understand why, but the foundational foundation of the profession is in that isolation, right? In a very defined boundary. Um, so it was a very interesting experience in, in that sense. But, but I think you're spot on. I think that's the question that I'm kind of trying to really address, too. And we have one last question. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, or I'm sort of, or I was really taken by this idea of having and flowing, and, and I can really um, resonate with this idea of uh, exchanging ideas and thought and emotion in that way. Um, and I also was taken at a moment when you were talking about the difference between um, precedent and uh, cover being feeling. Um, and I, I deeply believe that architecture makes us feel things. Uh, and so I'm wondering, do you see that process similarly, that, that it is this sort of ebb and flow, it's sort of an organic or bi biologic process that we, um, that feelings come to us from buildings and that we can also impose our feelings on buildings? or is that a different process? I don't know if it's necessarily different or not, but I, I, my theory, one of them, is that you don't remember spaces, you remember how you feel in them. It's the same way like when you draw, it's really hard what you imagine all the spaces. You're trying to simulate it by kind of the same mind, or you, you grew that, grow that muscle as an architect where you anticipate a little bit, you know what a certain dimension in a certain space is going to be like, but it's really hard to project it. I think partially because we remember how we felt in a space more so than, than whatever feeling a space means. So, and that depends on, on light, on time of day, on people, and where you are physically, and, and so on and so forth. 
point. So, um, I, I, yeah, I, I think there is something real there in terms of that we always have to translate or anticipate certain things. And kind of architecture to be very aspirational in that sense, because you can't do mock-ups, you can't do, I don't know, versions of this before choosing the one you want. So you kind of anticipate certain things, you can simulate certain things, but you still don't quite know. Plus, there's a contract here involved um, <laughs> with a very specific job there to ruin whatever you imagine. It depends on the contract. But, um, but so, and I, I, I think there is, a, I think it's not oftentimes talked that way, or I think there is a, uh, uh, understood, like we, we, I think we're not oftentimes talking about the fact that we are, we're quite limited, I think, in that perspective in terms of what, in terms of what we're putting out there, right? We can prom, we can, we can hope and we can promise, but only so much. And I think there's something that's, that's beautiful about that and, and being realistic about it. And I mean, anyone who is built will have gone through that process with their clients, like sooner or later that will reveal itself. Um, but I think that's where the, what, where the, for me, the beauty of the whole miracle of it is too, is you will discover and see things you couldn't have anticipated. Um, and, and I mean, not to mention the fact that we're judging so much of what we're judging as architects through images which is kind of an insane thing. We're also the only people who consider Rhino to be 3D. I tell that to anyone who deals with 3D. They would, they would laugh at us. I tried once to do a um, project with Google, and they were trying to implement the whole uh, VR thing through Chrome. It can't be confidential right now anymore. Um, but uh, it was interesting because we were speaking to different languages. What they understood as 3D was so different than what we as architects understood as 3D. And so, yeah. I think there's a reality there with regards to to how what we make of spaces architecture so on and so forth. And all of that to say that I I 100% do believe in in beauty. And I thought it was interesting also you know this conversation on feelings or what was mentioned that well when we did precedence we just didn't mention feelings because yes music is immersive you can't avoid it it gets to you in ways in which nothing else can get so. If that's all there is to it, if that's the sole purpose of it in the context of the studio, that it just drags you a little bit in, a little bit deeper, it doesn't give you a way out as easy as other things do, I feel that I'm, I'm quite happy with that too. I guess I have a, like a brief point of clarification. I found it so interesting that you're talking about um, baggage, which for me immediately has a negative connotation, not that it has to, and I'll, I'll try to point my question by pointing to something that I think is related, which is, let's say, art history, classical art history, we have iconography, which is also has a negative connotation, but it has useful baggage, I would argue, because it's able to move freely between style across time and culture. So it becomes a line that's able to kind of transcend those things and kind of a fluid frame of reference. What about baggage? What is baggage for you? Why, why the desire to leave it behind? I mean, it depends, I think, a little bit on the context. I think if I use it in relation to, to existing things is when you come from the outside and you see too much of one thing, whatever it becomes too one-sided as a conversation, you're just trying to poke it. You want to, to either, but also partially because there's a reality to our profession, which is not looking great. And it seems like we're a little bit like, I don't know about you, but headless chicken running around and kind of ignoring certain things. And it's, it's a tough spot to be in and to be doing or trying to do what we're doing. Um, but I am with you in the sense that things in, self, in themselves, let's say in this case baggage or references, or none of them in my perspective are negative or positive, right? It's, it's all about what you choose to make of something. And I think there's a, I think you're absolutely right. So this isn't so much against something as it is for other things. Um, I think it's important to, in keeping in mind, and it's, it's just a desire to question everything including the things that seem to be ingrained or set in stone. Which again, it's a privilege and easy position to come in from the relative outside and be like, why? Um, but then you also have to offer something else. And there's a reality in learning and learning a lot in that and understanding why so many things are, are the way they are. Or, yeah. Uh, 